Hey everybody, welcome to the PC Perspective Podcast. This, um, what do I normally say? Do I usually say the number or do I introduce us? This is episode number? This is episode 431, being recorded on December 28th, 2016. I'm Ryan Shrout. I'm Josh Walrath. And I'm Alan Malmontano. And where's Jeremy? Uh, Jeremy's at the airport. Detained? Oh. Probably. Apparently they lost all of his luggage or something. I don't think he was going to make it back in time anyway. Sweet. I will say Josh does look more blue than normal. Well, he hang does. on. It's getting worse. Oh, wait. There Try you go. That. Try now. Let's look at... Uh, mm. eh, no. Still kind of bluish. Yeah. yeah. I want to walk in that room one day and see what the lighting actually looks yeah, like. Yeah, because we never get the, the true... It's always a little bit different. It's actually about like five feet by two feet, and there's just a backdrop. <laughs> it's, yeah. yeah. It's it actually, only looks like a mess because... It's a printed... It's, yeah. That's a poster. It's like the time I was. Painting. It's like the time when I was in England, and one of the palaces was being reconstructed, oh, and, and they, they put, put scaffolding up in yeah. front of it, and then they put a picture of what the building looked like yep. on the scaffolding. Yep. And there are still people in front of it, like taking pictures. <laughs> yeah. With it, right? And I was just like, mm-hmm. that's why they do that, so that if you're taking, maybe pictures, I guess, you know? well, like, ironically, that would be you funny. can always get the photo of the castle. But you can't get a photo of the fake castle with the scaffold. Like you can't. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. the rare one. That's true. That's true. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, well, well. Uh, so let's get to uh, the show, I guess. Welcome, everybody. It is Wednesday night at about 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific, which is where we record the show live on Wednesdays um, at pcpro.com slash live. Uh, come in, join us on the chat. You can make fun of any misspellings we have in our rundown, which Alex will have to take responsibility for. And there, we've already seen one. It's too late to change it now, guys. This is just what we got to do. You told me now. I just tell you now because someone in the chat told me now. Um, I'll, I'll fix it. I don't know what the Australian X99A is, but, hmm. you know, it's a much better version of it. It's the a bigger skit. on the bottom? Yeah, I don't know. Um, so uh, if you need a reminder about our live streams, you can go to pcpro.com slash subscribe. You get uh, this wonderful page right here that asks for your name and your email address. And we send you a notification a couple of hours or an hour or something to that effect uh, before the live stream. Uh, this will be more important even uh, coming up into the new year as we approach uh, CES. Um, me and Alan and Ken... Uh, Ken and Alan and I. Oh, there you go. We'll be at uh, CES starting January second. I think we come home on what the seventh. Do we come home on the seventh or the eighth? The seventh, I think. Actually, well, that's a long trip. Yeah, it's five days. It's a long time. Um, so we'll be out there. We'll be, we'll do at least you know a couple of podcasts out there. The time of which will be totally dependent on when we get our content done, when we get back to the hotel, and all that type of stuff. So uh, it will not be at the normally scheduled Wednesday at ten p.m. Maybe it will be, but I doubt it. Um, so it's important for you to go to pcpro.com slash subscribe and sign up for that, uh, and then we will send out a notification. Probably in that instance, we'll only be able to tell you like a half an hour in advance. Uh, but if you follow me on Twitter, if you follow PCPro on Twitter, uh, I'll make sure you guys know um, uh, all that type of stuff as well. So um, let's see. Where am I going the wrong way on this? Also, we still have our Patreon going. We launched it after last year's CES. Yep. We're filmed not going to do on location. Filmed on Vegas, location. Nevada. That's right. If you watch uh, this very video, uh, oh, hey, like PC Purse Live, um, you can see, look at that. That's me from CES last year. And I, damn it, I was packing that exact same sweater. You've, you've worn that same sweater since you've had it. I love it. I love it. And I don't travel enough with like to wear fancy, like I don't wear fancy clothes enough to matter. But since everything gets recorded on video, it kind of screws me up. Uh, anyway, <laughs> patreon.com slash PCPro takes you to this page. It is your um, ability to uh, contribute to us on kind of a recurring monthly fashion, right? If you think the content we do is cool, if you think the podcast we record is neat, uh, the videos that we make, any of that type of stuff, um, this is your way to contribute. Whether or not you just think we're worth a couple of, couple of bucks a month or you run an ad blocker and you feel guilty about it or something to that effect, Um that's the only shot that was not recorded on location. Alan's redubbing uh, over here. Let me, let me, I'm going to rewind on that. There you go. Alan, Alan's oh, redub. I, I yeah. had to do the mad scientist redub. Uh, yeah. Um, so patreon.com shows PC per we thank to, we have 396 pa- patrons. Those are 396 people that call us and remind us Who is it? on a regular basis uh, that they appreciate the stuff we do. And it's really cool. And we thank you guys for it. And as is usually the case, and I don't know where my phone went. 
damn it. Um, if, you, if you update, increase, or become a patron for the first time uh, on the show while we're recording, I will mention uh, you, call you out, and whatever you decide to put in the name field will will work there. So um, we greatly appreciate it. I don't think we're doing any uh, second revisions of the video uh, while we're at uh, at the at CS this year, but um, you know we'll do we'll do what we can. So let's get into content. It's it was a short week as it tends to be uh, as we go through the holidays, right? Um, last week we did our show with uh, David Hewlett. Was that last week? It was on yeah. Monday, last Monday. So it was yes. a little over a week ago. Uh, where we where he picked crazy robot chefs, and I picked. $16 infrared thermometers, but it was our holiday, uh, our holiday special edition. Yeah, that guy. Um, this week, uh, similarly slow on stuff. We have a couple of reviews I'm just going to mention that you should go to the website and check out. The first being Sebastian's look at the DOS Prime 13 DOS keyboard, oh. um, which is it's a brand and it's a, uh, a, a series of keyboards that's been around for a while, right? Like, it's not a new thing. They've been around before the whole, like, Cherry MX Switch explosions. They've really? been doing buckling springs for a lot of years. My, my, my memories of DOS keyboard is they were the ones that released the keyboard with no letters on the keyboard. Oh, yeah. And I always wanted to get one of those. So you had to touch type? Yes. Yeah. I know it, for you that would be that would no, be mass that, that hysteria. Will not, that will not yeah. work. It's the it, Tyrannosaurus it, it, Rex. I, I had one for a while and yeah. it worked fine until you tried to use like a modifier and you went, oh no. Yeah, <laughs> like which one is the asterisk? You yeah. know, shift six, shift seven. I you just start hitting random uh, punctuation. Turns out it's actually eight. Damn it! See, I was see? wrong twice. It would have screwed me up. So this this is not that. This has. You can see uh, a lettering on the keys. It is a Cherry MX Brown keyboard. Um, and uh, Sebastian does a good job of kind of going through this. It's got USB pass-through. I mean, pretty basic functionality, right? Um, it's got the two USB connections, so you actually get power through that that uh, other connection. It's backlit, um, plain white LED backlighting. And although uh, some people might like the RGB, Sebastian mentions he is a fan of the plain white LED backlighting. It did get a gold award. It's $149, um, so it is expensive. Um, but most cherry keyboards these days are. So if you're if you're interested in that and kind of what the unique spin that DOS keyboard brand brings to uh, keyboards, is it actually cherry switches? Uh, I think so. Mm. Yeah, MX Brown switches within yeah, the Prime 13. Okay. So it must be it's new to them, I assume, right? Yeah, I haven't kept up with them since like mechanical keyboards became a popular thing again. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that was uh, posted up by Sebastian. Alan posted up a re-review of the Samsung 750 Evo series of products. Plus one capacity that we had not previously reviewed. Okay. So they introduced Did a, the other capacities change somewhat? What do you mean? Like performance-wise? Uh, Didn't they only change? Because, only because we're testing differently now. Oh, okay. So it's not like a Rev 2 of those other... No, no, no. no. Okay. The 120 gig and the 250 are still the same. Okay. Uh, they only launched those two capacities, mm -hmm. right? Um, the 120 specifically, they kind of had to launch because they updated the 850 Evos to use the 48 layer flash. And when mm -hmm. they did that, they dropped the 120. So they had to make a 120 uh, of something for because people. Are we maybe past the era of the 120 gig SSD? I don't think so because, like, it's, you know, nice, less than $100. Thing. How much is this? The 120 gig 750. Uh, I think it's like, it's like 70 or something. I have to look yeah. at the end again. Um, I mean, they're all, you know, these are definitely budget drives. So $61. Okay. So I got 61 bucks. Yeah. The 250 is still less than 100 bucks, 89. Oh, why would you buy the 120? Well, you know, oh. um, I kind of agree with you, you know, since the price is yeah. that aggressive for that one, right? It, it goes from 51 cents a gig to 36 cents a gig. That's why the prices are so close yeah, to each just other. Just my chair. I'm not shorter than Alan. Um, but then for 30 cents a gig... <laughs> That's too tall. Uh, at 30 cents a gig for 148 bucks <laughs> is the uh, 500 gig model, which is the, the newer introduced one. It came out after the initial launch. Um, I wait, think... Wait, what, what came out after the, the initial... 500 gig model. Which what, It launched with the 250 and the 120? No, after... The 500 came out after. What did it launch with? 
120 itself. 250. Okay. I thought you were saying the 120 was the new one. You're saying the 500. No, no, no. The 500 is the new one. Okay. I got you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And Um, how much is the 500 again? It was 148 bucks when I checked. Wow. And and just think how much that 850 Evo is on sale every once in a while. Um, It's like two bucks more. Yeah. But if you catch this one on sale, it might be even less. It might than, be 139. You know. uh, it's not currently available on Amazon. The probably 750? Yeah. It says there's a new model of this item and it points you to the 850 Evo. Oh. Really? Yeah. I mean, it's it'll probably great. come back in stock or whatnot. It probably just sold out during the holidays because it was the cheapest 500 gig drive that you can get from Samsung. Right? Yeah. Even though it was only a little bit cheaper than the 850 Evo. Right? Um, but as it turns out, uh, when looking uh, at all of these drives with our new testing um, if you go to let's see oh, hold on let me point out before we move on the 750 Evo 500 gig does have a used like new Amazon fulfillment <laughs> for 116 well that's not going to be there for very long so unless they got a ton of them unless they it's got an Amazon warehouse deal right so it's oh. a thing but one, 116 is pretty cheap 116 it's for not new gig. I get you know that's sure. what that means. It's not new. It was returned or refurb or something like that. But yeah, uh, but Jeff but of it, X Tech Report, he bought a bunch of them and, and did like three petabytes worth of testing <laughs> and then sent them back. That's 23 cents a gig. 23.2 cents per gig. Yep. Uh, yeah. Almost in the tens. Getting there. Yeah. We got two more days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so for the, uh, again, we're doing the new testing on these now. Right. Right. Um, something very interesting that came about. What from page that, am I looking at? Uh, the client Q depth weighted. Uh, yep. Okay. Uh, comparisons. Yep. Right. If you look at that first chart there, so we got the the three different capacities of the 750 Evo, mm-hmm. right? 500, them. 250, 120, mm-hmm. and then I threw in a 850 or 750 Evo, and then I threw in a 850 Evo 500 gig, right? Which you'd figure is it's very high performing drive, right? Uh, look at how close they are to each other in those results, mm-hmm. right? Um, and that is, uh, that's random access, but weighted for what we view as like your typical client usage, like the Q depth that the drive is going to sit at most of the time. Now, these numbers are much lower than you would expect. Like the, you know, it's only like 16,000 IOPS and like 47,000 IOPS. Uh, but that's how these drives perform at very low Q depths. Consumer workloads. Consumer workloads. Yeah. So Um, what is the blue one terabyte? Remind me of that. Uh, that is a Western Digital Blue One Terabyte. We haven't done the full review of it yet. I just included those results and comparisons because that's a drive okay. that's out and has been competing. Okay. Um, and uh, but see, here's something that I, I point out: like the Ultra Two, the yeah, SanDisk Ultra Two, which is a drive that universally gets shit on. It does. Looks okay there. It's doing good there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I just I, I just wanted to make yeah. that known. And what I noted before this and like. We actually didn't review, didn't do our official review of that drive when it first came out, um, because when I ran it through our original test suite, oh, is there an there's a helicopter outside. Oh. That's probably right. fine, guys. When I ran it through our original <laughs> test suite, it did horribly. The it did Ultra really Two, bad. yeah, it did really, yeah. it did so bad, in fact, that I emailed Sandisk and went, "Hey guys, I'm just going to hold off on doing this one because like we need we we need either better testing or you guys have a problem with your drive." I'm not sure which one it is. We'll just we just kind of mutually agreed to okay, we're just not going to publish on that one, right? right? But look at that. It's interesting. Like that looks pretty good. And then even if you go to sequential, uh, the Ultra Two, which is the next chart down, the Ultra Two is lower performing than the other ones, but not by much, mm-hmm. right? Now realize these are burst, like sequential and uh, random workloads we're working at. In other words, things you're typically doing on a computer, you're not going to sit there and just you know, where are you going to get something at 400 meg per second continuously sure. to write to your SSD? Right. Right. And the the last data entry there, the 600P, that's an NVMe Intel SSD. That's, that's their budget. low cost NVMe drive. Yeah. So that's Correct. a, a right. budget NVMe. I could have included, you know, could have gone crazy and put like 960 Pro in there or something like that. But that's, that, sure. you know, those drives are like three times the cost per gig of these other comparison points. So are these all relatively considered budget drives in their yeah, categories? They're okay. all within a few cents either way on their okay. on their cost per okay. gig. Yeah. Um if you scroll down a little more, just in case people are curious, uh this is the everything chart. This is the everything charts. Okay. So I kind of have these everything charts. These are all the drives tested on uh the new suite. And I have been kind of busy 
like testing a whole bunch of these drives on the new suite, as you can tell by just how many comparisons. So are these are chart. sorted by the read result. Uh, yes, um, they're sorted by the read result because you're. So again, if we look, look at the top, the 960 Pro, the 950 Pro, the mm -hmm. SM 951, the 950 Pro, 256 gig. These are all NVMe, PCIe SSDs. Yep. Uh, where's the top SATA drive in this? The top uh, oh, SATA. Uh oh, where'd you go? Way to go. <laughs> uh, the top SATA by read results, believe it or not, is the Western Digital Blue. That one terabyte blue. Hmm. That's um, different. Yes, that that controller is actually just very good at low latency reads specifically. It doesn't do as well on writes. Okay. Um, as you can tell by that same, you know, the red bar right, right. next to it and that chart is significantly lower than even some the, of the ones around it. Yeah. Yeah. Than, yeah. yeah. Um, That's orange, by the way. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure we were looking at the same graph. We are. We're looking, That's at, all. We're okay. looking at the same graph. Um, you go a little bit further down, though, and you see you start to see the mix of 850 Pros and then 750 yep. Evo mixed in there. Um, What's at the bottom? And you, Oh, keep going. Keep, keep going. Go keep going. Keep going. Here we go. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Nope. No. Nope. Now you got me curious to know which one is the bottom oh, of this chart. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of results here. Uh, okay, Super Talent SSD 60 gig. Oh, that's the one you put on my desk, and I didn't know we had. Uh, with I a little sticky on it. Please test this. And uh, that yeah. was one of the original, if not the first SSD I ever got. Yeah, I think second. It the, either the OCZ SSD was the first one I ever had, <laughs> or the Super Talent SSD, because I think I had one of them was 30 gigs. Yeah. What's the SSD 525 60 gig? That's an Intel drive, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, the 525s are all... Yeah, I think uh, I had a 30 gig OCZ. I'll look for it for you. Maybe not. So it has a 39 in IOPS on uh, uh, uh -huh. writes. Uh -huh. That's 39 operations. Per, I feel 39. like Ken could do more op operations per second than that. Yeah, SSD. yeah. Uh, there are hard drives. Mm. <laughs> there are hard drives that could do more than 39 yeah. IOPS. Right. Um, so, so the reason we're including these is I, I, a lot of, I often get questions via email like hey i have drive x is it worth it for me to go to this other one right so the only way to really answer all those questions for people is to put of just a crap load of results in a mm -hmm. chart yeah and just go here here's everything we've tested like see where the difference is where you're at yeah, versus where you're, where you're at. gonna, where where you're gonna go. buy if you to. had an original x25m you're only running at like eight thousand random reads there and the random writes are actually pretty bad it's near the bottom of that guy yep. and then you know, you can give yourself an idea of the relative, like how much of a jump. And then likewise, if you go near the top of that chart, looking at those NVMe versus SATA, you'll notice it's not like the multiple time improvement that the that you see in the burst specs. read speeds might tell you. Yeah. So yeah. your lower Q depth performance of these NVMe SSDs, like when it comes to random reads, uh, you're still waiting on flash. Mm -hmm. the, the flash hasn't just suddenly become so much faster. Each individual die is not suddenly doubling its throughput. Right. It's just the interface is much better, like to, to the host, right? Uh, you can do sequentials way faster. You can do other stuff way faster. But when it comes to just the random read stuff, like booting your OS, anything that's like read intensive, anything where your hard drive would have been thrashing about, right? it's not that much of a jump. It's like maybe 20, 30% bump from from like good SATA to even really good NVMe. Hmm. You know, so... So don't bother buying any storage devices ever, I guess. Well, no, it's just like... It, it, you got to hear, guys. You, you should just consider that when, you, if you already have a good SATA SSD, consider that when you're fair. You know, thinking about going NVMe, it is much more convenient. You can put the M.2 built into a motherboard if you have a newer motherboard, and it's like you don't even have to install an SSD. It's just part of the motherboard, basically. Once right. you've done it, right? It's a really elegant, hmm. really simple solution. But any other uh, specific results from this particular review, or do we just we're just because I mean this is this is a product we've all seen, but well we've seen before, except in that in that new capacity. But. Um, something probably just worth mentioning is, uh, and this is because we're talking about Samsung SSDs and you might be comparing to other SSDs than Samsung. I would look at the trim speed okay. page, um, and just kind of go just straight down to that other chart. Which one? Just the big one. Okay. And if you start flipping down this, you'll notice that most of the modern SSDs, so you've got like a bunch of Samsung SSDs. What, 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 what am I looking at? File delete under load. Seconds per gigabyte? Yes. This seconds, is, seconds of this latency. This is if you delete a file, uh -huh. how long does it take the trim command to be processed through the SSD? How much latency in total <clears throat> gets added to other stuff going on? 
how much how much slower is your consecutive reads or writes yeah. while the trim operation yeah. is happening. If you had some other stuff going on in the background, say you were say you launched Office at the same time that you deleted, deleted a ten gigabyte file. Uh, yeah, then this is how many seconds worth per gig okay. that would have added to that other thing you were trying to do. Okay, right. So um, 850 Pro, nothing. I mean, most of these are close to nothing, right? I don't a know, point zero zero two seconds? Uh, yeah, well, something. I mean, a lot of these are very close to nothing. Sure. Then, uh, when you get down to, and actually, I need to uh, I need to remove that super talent from this chart because it didn't have trim. So it gets a low number just because, like... It didn't have it any... It didn't do anything when it got a trim commit. That seems fair. <laughs> um, anyway, but as you get down to some of the older SSDs... Uh, or even in some cases, like M8PE, which is a brand new Plexter SSD, which is like, you know, 0.26. Where am I looking? What times? Uh, you here? know, I'm just getting to where it starts to ramp up. Oh, you went like way down to the bottom. Oh, okay. Um, you can notice, like, you start to drift into a bunch of OCZ stuff territory for mm -hmm. some reason as you get to the bottom there. Yeah. Um, the Trions. The Trions, the, uh, something about... The Neutrons are down there. Uh, Vertexes. Yeah, yeah, neutrons are down there. And what this boils down to is just the way that trim was implemented in the firmware of these drives. Like, how do they handle trim? What do they do when they when trim gets issued, right? Right. Um, some of these SSDs are actually, like, doing some data juggling and, like, you know, rearranging stuff, and they're doing it right then. Like, mm -hmm. they're not waiting till later. Samsung is really good about, okay, you want to trim? Fine. Like, I'll, I'll do it, you know, when you're not busy, basically, okay. right? Uh, a lot of those other ones near the top are good about doing that. But the, the ones other ones the, pause every other action and say, we're going to complete this trim operation first? Uh, yeah. And they'll do it. You know, you'll delete your file. A I mean, few seconds will go by. Like, if you look at that, like, ver uh, Vector 180 is the worst offender here. That's five seconds of a delay every gigabyte you deleted. So if you deleted a 10 gigabyte file, it's 50 seconds. Yeah. That you have to wait. Yeah. It where will nothing hang. can happen? Well, some stuff might happen just very slowly. Mm. And it and that will continue. That state will continue. Like, I mean, it's kind of interesting because you look like SSD 520, 525. These are Intel SSDs yep. that have you know over a second and a half per gig on this. Yep, those were um, those were older. Oh, like, yeah. I'm I'm pretty sure they were Sandforce mm, uh, okay. M SATA yep. SSDs, right? Um, you know, so you can tell this was like the older SSDs, right? But there are. There are some modern ones that kind of have that. Mr. Issue. Black says in the chat, he was wondering how far down he would have to scroll till his vertex would show up. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, dude. And then um, the, <sighs> next, the next big chart there is a full partition trim. This is a trim, and it's in the same units. It's seconds per gig. But this is a trim with nothing else going on. Okay. Okay. This is like if you were creating a new partition on your drive? Yes. So we start the drive in a state where all of it has been written. Right. So it's forced to clean up everything, the whole drive front to back. Um, and then we correct for how big was the drive, and it's, it's you know, correct. So the Radeon R7 480 gig at 0.7 seconds per gig would take 480 <laughs> times 0.7 seconds to uh -huh. format? Yes. Oh. If it was full before. Sure. Right? So basically, okay. if, you were, if you were reinstalling Windows and you deleted all the partitions and then you recreated one partition... It would hang for that long, and actually, that's one of the ones I went back and double checked the source data, and it actually did, you know, just sit there yeah, for so a very long technoscope time. Technoscope in the chat says 0. 0.172 seconds. That's 0. 0.172 seconds per gigabyte of the drive. Yes. Yeah. That had been written. Uh, yeah. 0. 0.17. Yeah. That's he's looking at the vertex four. Yep. On that, so. Yeah. So that's there are some drives that have that's been it. very mm -hmm. painful, and actually, uh, the. The Vector 180s yeah. is the ones where we actually had a back and forth with OCZ before they launched, and they updated their firmware before the launch, and that's the better result. Hmm. It was worse. They would have been at the top of the chart. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so interesting things to look at, because those are things that you might not have thought of, and there are no specifications anywhere. Nobody rates SSDs for this. Nobody else is testing SSDs for this, mm -hmm. right? But if you're moving a bunch of files off of your SSD, every time the next file gets moved off, that's a delete. And you're still trying to read the next file that's being sure. moved off, right? So If you're moving it, not copying it. Yeah. 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 So if you're just moving stuff to some other drive and you notice like just that, that chart or that uh, plot just keeps 
hiccuping downward like every time another fog gets done. Right. Which I've seen a lot. And that's actually one of the reasons that I was like, you know, there's got to be something going on here. We got to figure this out. That's cool. So, yeah, it's just good stuff to know and be aware of before you. Uh, we will be talking about that more soon. Yeah. So that's the 750 Evo and a new testing stuff. Yep. Uh, before we get on to our next story, I have some uh, Patreon updates here. Uh, James Barber edited their pu- their pledge from five dollars to nine ninety nine. Josh nine ninety nine. <laughs> <laughs> we almost caught him off guard. Uh, Terry Corker pledged three dollars. Thank you, LL Cool J J A Y LL Cool J pledged three dollars. Thank you, and Michael. Oh, last name J E Z, and then some other letters after that. Pledged uh, five dollars. Jazerski, I'll say is his last name. Mike, Mike, Mike Wazowski. Close. Just oh. gotta pick one pronunciation and stick with it. Jazerski. There you go. Yeah, that sounded Perfect. that sounded good, right? He's not gonna correct. It's you. legitimate. He He's gonna send me another email. You have to up if it. he ups it you to six dollars. He can put a phonetic. Yes. Yeah, a pronunciation of the name. So thank you, James, Terry, LL Cool J, and Michael uh, for your uh, patronage, I guess, if you will. Um, real quickly, we'll mention Maury's review of the Asus X99A2. This is where we're at on motherboard naming, by the way, guys. This is the X99A2, the sequel. Part two. Yeah. yeah. I don't know what made me look at this. At some point, I saw it today. Do you remember when X99 launched? Huh. Uh, if I had to guess, I would say June of 2014. No, uh, it was more towards November, I think. In 2014? Yeah. I knew it had been a long time. Yeah, it's been a while. And we and we still have like new X99 boards coming out. Yeah. I mean, it's still the most current chipset for that socket. Is the this is off subject, but is the plan when we what's next? Uh, Skylake E. We're on Skylake. No, we're on Broadway, aren't we? I can't remember anymore, to be I think honest. I think Bro- it is Skylake. No, I think the next is Skylake coming up. Yeah. Yeah. Is that going to be on X99? Surely not. I mean, actually, I would prefer it if it were, but I don't, I don't know. I haven't looked into it. Uh, so this is the X99A2. The A kind of uh, signifies that this is kind of their budget board in the in the line it's hard to say anything is a budget budget board when looking at x99 platforms but if you know you look at kind of like the uh back side connectivity um you know your four usb 3.0 ports two usb 3.1s a single ethernet connection this is somewhat minimal for a uh, high-end x99 motherboards um as as pretty much as I would I was I would classify all X99 boards to be at this point. The main features are you know uh, U.2 and M.2 slots, up to 32 gigabits of PCIe bandwidth, uh, onboard USB 3.1 Type C. Uh, it has the ASUS Aura RGB controllable onboard lighting plus four pin header for LED light strips, which I still think is cool. Uh, patent pending safe slot strengthened PCIe slots, uh, so you don't rip them out accidentally, I guess. Uh, Crystal Sound 3, five-way optimization. These are all features that have been in a ton of Asus boards for a long time. Uh, these, this is just refreshes uh, for updated features. USB 3.1, you know, Type-C, those types of things weren't in the original wave of X99 boards, obviously. You still get plenty of PCIe connectivity here, uh, multi-GPU support for three-way SLI and Crossfire um, with 40-lane processors, obviously. Um, no, no complications there. When if you have a 28 lane processor, you can still support three ways with uh, by eight by eight by eight configurations, uh, which works out pretty well there. Uh, mother uh, BIOS battery, CMOS battery replacement seems to be ideal. We'll check Maury's uh, plus and minuses there at the end. Look, you can see he's got one of those LED strips hooked up to that uh, four pin header, and it is indeed lighting up the LED strip as well as the uh, PCIe retention brackets, which you know. Our thing. I still think they're cool looking. Functionality wise, nobody cares, but um, plenty of SATA ports. You've got your U.2 in there. Do we have any news about any more U.2 drives, Alan? Is anybody else going to use U.2? I don't think so. Does someone make a U.2 to M.2 enclosure, maybe? Uh, I mean, Seems like that could be a useful thing for servers, at least. Yeah, but those are those tend to be more than just a single. Yeah. 
You know what I mean? Like you'd need one of those connectors for each drive yeah. you were putting in. So anything that's server oriented, it's going to be like some form of a chassis that has like two or four. Or yeah. More, Somebody in the more. chat says a data has a U.2 drive. A cage? No. It's the drive. Oh. Yeah. Well. They're making a U.2. So I they mean, have showed them at events for 12 months. So yeah. whether or not anything's ever actually come I mean, out. I mean, there are enterprise, other yeah. enterprise U.2 drives. Like we tested the Micron 9100. Sure. Right? Okay. There are other ones that are, but but the key is they're all enterprise. So if you're. It, it just you seems know. like all of the, like, it makes sense for consumers because all of these cases already have drive bays in them that aren't being used. So, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, but the, the U.2 drives might be a little too thick for what they considered uh, number of millimeters for you to put the, like you can't easily yeah. put it into a SATA spot, right? Unless you mean like a drive bay type yeah. thing? Not a uh, two and a half inch drive bay. Yeah, but it, that especially, but like if but you But is the U.2 connector indicating that or is it the form factor of the drive? Like you could make that's a- the physical form factor of the drive. You could make it thinner, right? U.2? Yeah. Because the connector is obviously bigger, but that's not what the connector's like on the drive side. So here's the thing. Typically, U.2 is what is also available as a PCIe card, like half height, half length mm -hmm. card, right? In order to fit that much circuitry or what's usually that much circuitry into the U.2 chassis, it's typically like multiple PCBs stacked. So sure. they're, they're folded over each other with a ribbon. Well, that's what we've seen so far, yes. Yeah, so... But it wouldn't have to be. You could make I mean, it thinner, but then it wouldn't be following like the standard for what's expected for U.2. The physical spec mm -hmm. for U.2 is the thickness is this much, yeah. like which I think is, it's not seven or nine, it's like 12 or 13 or something like that millimeters. But isn't that up to? I think it's an up to, but it, you, so you like couldn't mix larger ones with smaller ones in the same chassis for like a server because the airflow would then go all past the narrower ones and none of the airflow would mm. go past the thicker ones, right? Okay. So it's, you know. The chat is pointing out still more than SATA Express drives exist. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the SATA Express. Is, uh, that no, I don't think I ever saw a drive. I saw one. We saw an external dock unit. No, I saw a Western Digital drive. Did it, it actually a, go for sale? Nope. Okay, that's what I meant. <laughs> I saw it at uh, Flash Memory Summit. And the only time I ever, the only time I ever saw a device use SATA Express, ASUS sent it to us to test SATA Express. It was yeah. a docking station yeah. that you put a normal SSD it, in. Yeah, it was just an adapter to plug you stupid. into the SATA Express thing. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, so the X99A2, regardless of all that, uh, is a two hundred nineteen dollars motherboard. So again, relatively low cost for X99 product. Um, not low cost in the grand scheme of things, um, but but for X99 platforms, pretty good. Strengths, a lot of strengths. Uh, the only weaknesses is Maury said he had a challenging overclocking dial in. It may vary depending on your board and your chip. But look, CMOS battery placement's on there. M.2 port placement is on there. Yeah. Uh, uh, stock performance is on there. RGB LEDs, everything on there. Gold Award, a, a pretty good board for a pretty modest price, I would say, in the uh, in the grand scheme of that platform. So I'm guessing it's a vertical M.2, maybe? Um, I'm looking for it. Can't find I anything. see it no, right no. to the left of the uh, right next to the C heat sink. Yeah, next to the CMOS battery. Like it see extends the, to the oh, battery. Oh, it's going the other direction from it, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's it's the opposite than what I've normally seen yeah, yeah. on motherboards. But yeah. No, that's cool. It's It seems to work. Hooray. Yeah. yeah. Hooray. Uh, uh, all right, a couple of news items to run through. Fizon announces a UFS 2.1 NAND controller. Yeah. Uh, why do I care about this? Uh, because uh, EMMC needs to uh, die in a fire. EMMC being there's embedded a multi multimedia controller. Isn't that what that originally stood for, uh, yeah. I think? and there's a link to Sebastian's review, like the most recent EMMC thing that we looked at. Uh, somewhere in there, I have a link to uh, when I talked about how bad EMMC was, I made it a link, probably near the top. Um, but it was a link to the performance page of like uh, Sebastian's review of that Asus, really low cost Asus laptop. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, look Ooh. at that. Look at those write speeds. 201 kilobytes per second. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's pretty horrible. Um, I don't see what the problem is. For just about is, right? anything. So that's, so it's moving a header file. What could possibly... Uh, yeah. That seems fine. Yeah. So the problem that EMMC drives tend to run into is they're basically, they behave like old thumb drives when it comes to anything that's a random write. Okay. And they also do so in a way that kind of stalls any reads. 
that may be requested at the same time. So in other words, your OS just hangs All right. while this stuff's going on. So while Sebastian was doing that, if he tried to launch something else while that copy was going on, <laughs> it would basically just not do anything sure. until the copy was over. Yeah. Um, pretty bad, right? Uh, I mean, performance is so bad that like r- refreshing one of those machines or doing a re- Windows reinstall on one of those machines is like hard drive speed. It's like installing okay. Windows to a hard drive, not an SSD, right? Whereas so UFS... The UFS 2.1 should bring you know it's still a lower power protocol for transferring the data it's not like you know pcie 3.0 by 4 the flash interface kind of is 533 mega transfers per second yeah what's that transfer is that 533 I mean, it, megabytes i believe it just equally translates over yeah i hate that josh why do they do that sometimes why do they call them transfers like hyper transport did that crap too it, in reality it's probably less than that because of overhead Okay. But it's probably not a lot less than that. That is the flash interface to the processor that is 533 mega transfer. So, yeah, there's going to be other overhead involved Um, in it. So, you know, just a better interface, better ability to install flash into a device that's a lower power device that's not going to be a full-blown SSD. Mm -hmm. You know, but at least it's bringing you closer, right? It's, It's bringing you much closer to, like, SATA SSD speeds and performance and random performance than what we had before, which was like horrible for that kind of use case. And these, this is also in some cell phones, not mm-hmm. just laptops, right? There are some... You mean UFS? Yeah. You, yeah. Well, what will UFS will go into to replace EMMC because there's some cell phones that use EMMC I have flash. seen some... Hold on, let me think about this. I think I have seen an upcoming SOC mention UFS. Yeah, not surprising. Support in it. It's whether or not I know of any devices that have implemented it. Yeah. yeah. And... The, and a lot of people confuse this UFS that we're talking about here with UFS meant for like SD card form factor UFS. Okay, maybe. Right? Um, which could have also been seen on support in a chipset in a cell phone. Right. Um, but I think that's kind of going to take a while because people aren't that demanding on, you know, you don't have your OS installed to the SD card in your cell phone. Like you're, you have bulk media mm-hmm. on, on that thing, right? You're not doing a bunch of small random writes to that card. Or applications. You could have applications. In but Android, you, 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 yeah. I had, and on my last Android phone, I had a lot of applications on yeah. the SD card. And where you would see the performance hit there is when you're installing the application, not so much when you're running it okay. later. Because the, the rights. Yeah, the rights, the rights is what's kind gotcha. of horrible there. So there is also a UFS for SD cards that's going to speed those up. It's going to, you know, same kind of principle, just different, different thing you're talking to. Yeah. Right. Um, and so, the idea there is to get rid of, you know, all that SD kind of overhead, uh, you know, between the flash and the host. What? So, like, EMC 5.1 has been out for a while yeah. and is significantly faster than, like, the tests that Sebastian had in that article, in that review that you looked at. Yeah. So, I guess the question is, like, does, does UFS bring anything to the table that will make manufacturers implement it as opposed to newer versions of EMC, which they already aren't implementing, it seems, because stuff is still slow? I mean, I think I think 5.1 wasn't un- fast enough compared to the prior version, or at least, you know, the 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 throughput might have been a little higher, but it didn't fix the other root causes of like the small random writes, which is all the other overhead associated with EMMC as a protocol. Yeah. Right. So they just kind of needed it to be something else, basically. Hmm. In right. order for it to be better, yeah. right? It's kind of like you know, SATA got taken as far as it could. Now you need NVMe, right? Same kind of, same kind of deal. Um, so I think this is going to be you know, the push that it takes, and you'll have people just skipping over EMMC 5.1 and just going straight to this. Especially now mm-hmm. that there's two two controller manufacturers, right? Micron also has uh, UFS 2.1 hardware that they talked about like six months back or something like that. Well, anything that makes crap faster, I'm a fan yeah, of. Yeah, it'll make the budget stuff yeah. faster when it comes to storage. All right. Uh, oh, I did get another uh, new patron pledge from a different Michael <laughs> this time. Michael, man, last names. You can do it. <sighs> Michael Mann? Michael Theror. Michael Mann, last the- names. The- Theror. How would you pronounce T H E U R E R? Thur. Thurer. 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 Not Thoreau. Thurer. 
T H E U R E R. Just just think if you're you're starting a car on a really cold morning. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, he pledged five ninety nine to us, uh, so thank 599. you. Five ninety nine. Yes, exactly. Thank you, Michael. Five hundred ninety nine dollars. Yes. So, fi- no. Oh. No. Five dollars. So that's a lot of money. Just you know, making sure. I mean, you never know. One day. One day. You never know. Uh, all right, we've got a couple of other news items we're going to get to here. Uh, some some Lenovo stuff, pre CES announcements, which are a little bit interesting. Um, and then we'll get into some CES predictions and we'll get into the, the final stages of the podcast. First of all, uh, Lenovo announced updated ThinkPad lines ahead of CES. This is, I'm kind of a fan of them announcing this beforehand because Lenovo is one of those companies that generally announces like a thousand things at CES. Yes. And so, kind of getting some of these. Out, I don't want to say out of the way because it makes makes it sound negative, but out of the way. Lenovo is usually the big post for yeah. CES from we us. go see them first. They have nine things we have to talk about. <laughs> we have to it, learn about. It's the whole first day's <laughs> podcast, right? It's, it's <laughs> a, a bunch of stuff like that. So they announced um, new refresh models based on the seventh generation Intel Cabby Lake processors. Uh, which was absolutely expected. Uh, you've got like the Yoga 370 2 in 1, refreshed T series with the T47570, uh, the L series with the L47570. And Sebastian did a great post on this, and the new X270, an updated version of the ThinkPad 13. Um, so there's a number of new, f- uh, of new features. One of these, uh, I think a lot of these people will be interested in. One, Microsoft Signature. All ThinkPads come loaded out of the box with Microsoft Signature Image, which is clean installs, oh. no external software, no bloatware, none of that. So It probably has their little control center thing, but that's not... Uh, really I would assume bloatware. so, like their power control yeah, yeah, like their, center. Yeah. But it's I, would like, be, it's like, I would be shocked if they didn't have that. If somehow, yeah. unless they were able to like really work with Microsoft on power management side, that's one of yeah. ThinkPad's big selling features is the power management yeah. software. And they, they have, have them packaged as like like metro style apps now. I'm not sure that's better, but I understand. No, I mean it works. It works. It's like it's just a thing that's just like you you install it more easily than you would like a regular thing that you would get. Yeah. And I've also noticed that they're pretty good about like you install the first little piece of it um and then it just kind of like says, "Oh, hey, you have this laptop. You need this other thing, I'm just going to get that, and just like an auto. You saw this thing. when you had to, when you tried to reformat and reinstall on a, on that machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I reinstalled on on a ThinkPad, and it just kind of like it just worked. It was like, oh, you have a ThinkPad. Okay, here's here's this thing for ThinkPads, and then from that, once it got like the first little app, it just pulled everything else down. Yeah. So, uh, you know, pretty pretty good, and it's and it's still very clean. I'm usually very picky about like crapware and bloatware and and anything like that, and uh, you know. It's it, it's a it's a small enough thing. It does only the stuff it's supposed to do, and it's out of the cool. way for everything else. That's so good. Uh, they're adding Precision Touchpad, which is I didn't know. I don't know what Microsoft's PTP standard is. It is a Precision Touchpad standard. Microsoft Are you down with PTP. <laughs> usually, you know, me. You, you know me. Usually, usually I am. Uh, USB C anti fry protection. So you know. Oh, for uh, bad cables. Uh, yes, the, uh, it's it's protect totally from improperly fuse. designed malfunctioning USB USB C power supplies. Yeah. Uh, TPM 2.0 ThinkPad intelligent diagnostic codes. Oh, so wait. Intelligent. That's to protect from the power coming in being correct. Wrong. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I like the ThinkPad intelligent diagnostic codes. Intelligent diagnostics with musical tones from notebook interpreted by companion smartphone app. So you have a companion smartphone app. That listens to your laptop make tones okay. if there's some diagnostic. Just because people oh. are li- too lazy to type in error codes into Google, maybe your display can't turn on. Hey, you know what? I've, okay, I've watched interpretive one. dance. I'm not looking forward to interpretive <laughs> sound. We're we're one step away from the you know modem dial-up sound Look, again. There was a time <laughs> when motherboards spoke to me. Yeah, like motherboards say from Asus or mother <laughs> motherboards no. would say the memory error, mm-hmm. memory yeah. error. Betty, that was Betty, that was very Betty, shortly. Asus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I thought it was cool, maybe a little creepy, but it was effective. Yeah. Rather than reading those damn your CPU is not seated. <laughs> <laughs> That sounds about right. But then you probably run into the whole translation problems and, you know, 
turn on your system and it says it's heart touching and like you know all sorts of your processor is heart touching <laughs> your processor and rock solid rock Wait, solid and heart touching I performance I don't, what does this have to do with anything asus <laughs> um and maybe the most interesting thing that they've added uh is some of these models will have intel optane options in them um well, uh, hey let me there's, do my damn scrolling there's, there's, I'm, I'm, I'm listening right here oh, uh which is a non-volatile storage medium using pcim.2 format for significant improvements in endurance performance and power consumption that's pretty much all the detail that lenovo mentioned in their kind of uh, uh slides and presentation to us beforehand because yep. this is actually they said the capacity 16 gigs yeah yeah. This is the first time we've seen Intel Optane mentioned as a product spec. Yep. I believe. As part of a thing. As part of as part of an actual product spec. Yep. Now, uh, you added a couple of paragraphs to this post talking about crosspoint turned Optane yep. in this in particular. What what do we I mean, now that we know a capacity, mm -hmm. it's 16 gigs. We yep. know that it's NVMe uh, M.2. Yep. And we know that it's a 2242 package. Yeah, which is just a small, which is shorter, just a, a shorter M.2 yeah, 42 millimeter card. long M.2. So now SSD. we know, based on the leak slides we've seen before, uh -huh. what the performance will be. Yes. 285,000 IOPS on random 4K. Uh huh. Up to 1.4 gigabytes per second sequential read, 300 megabytes per second sequential write. Yep. It, what does this do for somebody? Right. We, we, do we, we still don't know the software implementation is the problem, right? Which, well, um, we can kind of guess what it's going to be based on. And I would guess that it started with uh, this guy right here, which is a 20 gigabyte SLC Intel SSD. Remember that guy? Yeah. That's Larson Creek, which was the original like Z68 RST caching thing. This right? was to add to a hard drive yes. based system to get caching capability. Yes. And that right? was like in 2011 is when yeah. we looked at that thing, yeah. right? Uh, but the reason that that didn't really catch on, and there have been a lot of people that have known, like we talked about this back in June when we got the other uh, roadmap leak that talked about there was going to be a cross-point Optane system accelerator, right. or storage accelerator thing, right? And everybody immediately started to revert back to that guy and go, oh yeah, Intel tried that back then and it was horrible. Actually, we tested that back then. It wasn't horrible. It's that... SSD prices, like that was an SLC SSD, 20 gigabytes of SLC back in 2011, mm -hmm. was expensive. Sure. And then it was quickly overshadowed by uh, almost immediately people were buying 64 gigabyte MLC SSDs and using them as an RSD cache because 64 gig was the, the top amount that, the that you could do. Okay. Uh, because you could just get a 64 gig SSD for cheaper than that 20 gig SSD at the time, right? But then that was almost immediately superseded by... Oh, hey, I can just get a Vertex 128 gig. And put your whole OS on And it. just put the whole OS on it anyway. Sure. So then the caching thing just kind of was like, eh, right? Just, just put, put your whole OS on it yeah. anyway, right? Um, okay. But Convince now, me why I care now. Well, a couple of reasons. Now, 120 is kind of pushing it for oh, you know, yeah. typical OS install, sure. right? Just, you know, people got more stuff, right? Yeah. So, Hell yeah. So that's stuff. pushing it in the first place. Um, second... Even though these specs don't reflect it because they're showing specs that people are used to seeing. They're looking at 4K and they're looking at 128K. Mm -hmm. uh, I suspect your random performance of anything smaller than 4K, which would be even better for things that you would want to cache, uh, like directory metadata updates that are like a single sector. Like okay. there, There's some stuff that's very small that really throws off the performance of an SSD and especially a hard drive. Okay. Okay. Uh, that crosspoint isn't that crosspoint succumb to yeah, doesn't succumb to crosspoint will probably scale like almost linearly even going to those really small values because crosspoint is like byte addressable okay you can you can rewrite a byte of crosspoint you can overwrite just one byte of it okay uh, whereas NAND you have to do like you know depending on how badly it's fragmented and how many paint how much it's full already you have to do anywhere from like you know, four or eight K all, it could be all the way up to like four megabytes or six megabytes. Hmm. If you got caught like with it having to erase a whole block just to change that one byte, right? This stuff, you want to change a byte, you just change a byte. Okay. Uh, so, and it's non-volatile. So that could change the way that Intel uh, integrates their caching with, if you integrate caching in a way that you consider that, oh, that thing is going to be there through a reboot. Mm-hmm. Now you can leave stuff there 
that hasn't been. I mean, this put. was there before reboot. Between reboot, did it have to rebuild the cache every time it restarted on this? It was rebuilding the cache. It okay. didn't have to, but yeah, there were there were. It could have done it then too, right? And maybe it did some of that then, All right? Right. But when you compare that with just a regular like RAM cache kind of thing, it's different, right? This it behaves like RAM, behaves more like RAM performance wise, but is persistent. What right? what kind what so what data do you foresee being stored on an Optane drive? So Next this year, this being the first generation, I think it's just going to be whatever is done since this is not integrated so tightly into the system yet. Right. It's just another storage thing. Mm -hmm. So but it's going to be transparent to the consumer. It, yes, it should be transparent to consumer with. Well, yeah, it should be with like Intel's RST thing. It should just be pre-configured. Right. It'll it'll see if you have that driver installed, it'll probably just see this part and go, oh, that's a yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. I'll just use that. And it won't appear to the user as a drive letter or anything like that. Most likely it'll probably hide it. You know, all that should just be taken care of so it's transparent to anybody just using the system. But anything that's tiny access, you know, this will be faster at than even like a 960 Pro. I wonder if Intel is like th their software team is enormous. They know exactly how Windows works. Do they know the best files and things to. Yeah, move? RST is intelligent like it's a it's the driver it's like, a storage system driver it's not right? going to move serious sam vr to your optane drive well it might move pieces of it if you're frequently accessing it and they are very small pieces mm, okay but it won't move the whole game because uh, okay. it'll see you know, I, I, I don't know i i'm just i'm just really curious because like most of these systems that have Optane on them will still have SSDs on them. Uh, Not all of them. Some no, of them will be hard No, it's like drives. an either or in the specs. Yeah. Well, so I, I just took a look at what I was ThinkPad lineup because I was curious. Like, don't all ThinkPads come with SSDs these, these days? The T460, which mm -hmm. they specifically mentioned this in the T470, yeah. the two bottom SKUs still have 750 gig hard drives. In sure. That's it. Yeah. There are some that have hard drives in in like the, the detailed listings that we have as well. Even in the ones that now say Optane is optional, you could potentially, at least from what we can tell in the specs, it looks like you could potentially have not just an Optane accelerating an SSD, you could have Optane accelerating a hard drive in some of these models. Right, and it looks like it's it's about half and half on on some of that. And some of the higher end models will only allow SSDs, so you have Optane accelerating SSDs. I'm very curious yeah. to see what the advantage is of Optane accelerating SSDs. Yeah, I mean, I think the advantages to accelerating hard drives are obvious. You could, uh, for example. If it was a hard drive equipped system, and I don't know if Intel's going to make some kind of differentiation on this or whatnot, but like your hibernation file or whatever file right. Windows 10 is using for going to sleep, it could try to you know make sure there's some room on the Optane drive sure. to put that there, right? Now you're waking from sleep at RAM speed. Ramming speed. Yes, ramming speed. <laughs> right? You're ramming it's, speed. It's it's basically, you know, it's gonna be it's gonna give an SSD a run for its money as far as like loading is you're going to load your okay. hyper file at 1.4 gig per second basically right, right? um it, it just seems like 16 gig seems like just not enough space it's to probably, do anything it's probably not it seems like such a half hearted step in that direction right like yeah like well there is a 32 but not on any of these models but yeah right it doesn't the RSD well yeah I'll, re I'll rephrase for everybody It, 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 no, it, it, it runs on top of Windows. I thought it was pre-file system. Yeah, it's it's underneath the file system. Yeah, it's not like it's not. It's like using Intel RAID in the BIOS. Yeah, level. So it can really? it can be even if installed after the fact. Interesting. So I mean, I mean, it's a driver. It's it's at the driver level. So it, you know, it's a transparent. It's like a RAID driver basically. Okay. So, um, so it's tightly. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And in the case of this, it will just be tightly coupled on the SATA controller side. Mm -hmm. Or if it's an NVMe SSD, that would have to be also using the chipset. Right. Mm -hmm. You know how like the new Z170 boards or now 270 boards, like they have the chipset that either toggles back and forth between SATA channels mm -hmm. and NVMe. Mm -hmm. It's going to be the same deal on that side of it. It's just that you're going to have an extra few PCIe lanes which uh, actually in this first implementation, if I had to guess, would probably be com coming off of the chipset as well. 
Oh, I'm, I'm sure they would be. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you're, you know, you're going to be bottlenecked by DMA three in any of these cases, even mm -hmm. if it's like mm -hmm. stuff that's mm -hmm. cached in, going in to Optane. The CPU. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because you, you, it's going to have to be something that can at a hardware level during boot present itself as one volume, which means everything has to be underneath the chipset for it to pull that off. It can't be directly connected to the CPU. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's that's how that's how like RST is able to boot from something that's also a caching device. Like it treats when you have a cache set up, even in 2011, it treated it as if it was a RAID. Right. You had to have it in yeah. RAID mode. You had to have the RAID driver installed. Everything else had to be you know all the chain had to be set up as if it was a RAID. The unfortunate part is we won't really know more for a while. I, I, it We're wouldn't not. surprise me. Like I'm sure we'll see every uh, notebook vendor announce Optane options on their notebooks i'm very curious when they will ship yeah and lenovo doesn't say specifically they, they you know these models will ship in january 2017 but they're not saying which specific configurations yeah. will ship right it wouldn't surprise me if the optane options are like february or march of 2017 right before they're available sure. or maybe they'll we'll be a surprise and they'll be on the floor and bring a usb drive with some tests on it and see what you can we can nab out of it real quick but i, it, I don't know i, I wouldn't <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if Intel was strongly considering, like, internally to, uh, like, where they probably want to go with this is to have really slow, relatively slow TLC only SSD. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about an SLC cache on that anymore. That's your cache. Optane. What? Wouldn't you just build that into one SSD product? Like, wouldn't you make that one device? Uh, like have it in the same you like would, instead, instead you of DRAM, yes, you, you would, but they don't have a controller that can do it yet. Yeah, but if right. Intel wanted to do it, sure. If this was their end well, that, goal, that, that's would. probably where they want to go. But yeah. this is the first gen Optane. They're just trying to put it in something. <clears throat> yeah, right. And so, like that 16 gig, that's just one die of Optane, just hooked up to PCIe, basically. But that's that's what it is. It's not you know. Yeah. So the simplest controller they could come up with. It's just a direct shot to you know, a single channel of this stuff and not, you know, not be super power hungry and whatnot. Well, let's see what else we get out of that at CES. Uh, I'm very curious what we may find. Yeah, they're, if we're lucky, there'll be one of those machines there that actually has it in it. Hey, January 2nd. That'd be nice. Get your shit ready. Yeah. Uh, and also, real quick, I'll just mention this. Lenovo did unveil uh, ThinkPad Thunderbolt 3 and USB Type-C docks. These are exactly what you think they are. Uh, there's a Thunderbolt 3 and a USB 3.1 version of these docks. They have oh. slightly different configurations. What? You, That's so confusing. <laughs> it Isn't is. There a dock? There's a dock connector on this. Yeah. That's neither of those. Yeah, well. This is a brand new laptop. Sucks. It's not brand new. Yeah, that's the, the OLED. OLED. That's the OLED version. I mean, it's... It's, a year old almost. Yeah, it's probably eight yeah, months it's old. It's only been months. shipping for a few months. Yeah, but that was just the panel. Like, sure, they didn't sure. change the rest of the laptop. Um, yeah. So the Thunderbolt 3 dock supports up to three displays, pair display port outputs along with a full-size HDMI. Uh, the front panel offers a Thunderbolt 3 port, obviously for pass-through, USB, 3.5 millimeter audio, and the rear offers four more USB 3.0 ports, one for charging gigabit LAN and VGA output, of course, because it is a Lenovo product. <laughs> um and then uh, the Type C dock uh, supports two displays. V Display Port has three USB 3.0 ports, um, along with the legacy USB 2.0 ports, and uh, does have VGA in LAN. So it loses um, uh, the HDMI connection and some of the USB 3.0 connectivity as well. Um, I think there was there was pricing on these originally. I thought uh, like one forty nine and one ninety nine. That'd be say. pretty that's good. That's not bad. For, I think that's yeah, what that's they were bad. at. Yeah, that'd, two, be, two that'd be bucks. right in the right. Which yeah. will go along well with with my pick when we get to that at the end. Is just like a Type C, a Thunderbolt or Type C connection is you got you got you kind of have to have this. Yeah, if, especially if, if you, you have got the, one. If you've got the Apple problem. Well, yeah. Um, so, oops, sneak peek there. Uh, let's get into our uh, kind of. I don't know, CES bullcrap predictions about what we think we're going to see. Josh, I haven't heard enough from you Bull. today. <clears throat> it's it's like my whole Wednesday has been for naught. Uh -huh. So pick pick a subject, pick a topic. What do you think 
We'll see. Let, let's start with processors. Do, do we see anything else from AMD about Ryzen? Oh, that's yes. how it's pronounced now. You, they're they're going to have a spot like last year, and they're going to be showing off multiple systems running off Ryzen doing different workloads, whether it be gaming or have something set up so you could, you know, see how it encodes video and, you know, transcodes crap. And, and uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's going to be a ton there. They'll probably have a couple of uh, voltmeters. Well, at least, you know, those those wall meters showing how much it uh, it takes in terms of power. I can imagine half a dozen little things that they'll have up that they'll have working machines plus some of their APUs and you're never going to see another AM3 board again. That would be Hallelujah. That would be fine yeah. by me. Yes. So yeah, I, I think that you're going to see not just Ryzen, but you'll probably see uh, the Vega set up with Ryzen maybe in a back room where people can't really touch it. Um, because the uh, the GPUs seem a little bit more sensitive right now because I think Ryzen's a lot closer to being released than Vega is, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, they they certainly want to show off the CPU. They're gonna probably have a wall of motherboards of AM4 boards, both uh, for their previous generation Carrizo APUs and uh, Ryzen coming up. And uh, from what I gather, a lot of motherboard guys are excited about this because you know, they've been selling AM3 motherboards and FM2 Plus stuff, and but it hasn't been an exciting amount being shipped, as we can tell from AMD's numbers in the past several quarters and several years. But, uh, you know, there are a lot of AMD fans and people who have mm -hmm. bought an 8350 or an 8370 and have had that for years and years and years and years. Um, <laughs> yes. That's a lot of pent-up demand. And I think that uh, once they release it with new motherboards, there's there's going to be a rush to buy a lot of these things. And people who, who have been AMD fans for a long time and have been waiting patiently or impatiently. And uh, those who, uh, you know, may have, you know, jumped to the Intel train and, and want to jump back. Uh, because apparently having a Ryzen that's uh, eight core, sixteen thread, and, and competes well with the Intel sixty nine hundred, that might be tempting for those who have, you know, perhaps bought a forty seven ninety uh, or a sixty seven seventy K, and mm -hmm. you know have the excess cash to to make that kind of sidestep upgrade to Ryzen. So I think that uh, we're going to see a lot of that stuff. At CES, at least, you know, from the motherboard manufacturers and AMD and it's in its room. Yep. Uh, I think you'll see a little bit of teased info about Vega. But, yeah, I think I think it'll be pretty minimal uh, on that side. What about on terms of displays? Well, what about Go. maybe another CPU manufacturer? What do you think we might see? Who? Another Intel? Intel? Yeah. They're going to see Jack. In Intel? They make uh, CPUs? I, I think they just launched something. Well, so they'll have Cabby Lake, right? Yeah. I mean, we've only seen every leak possible about the 7700K come yeah. out this week. I'm just think... saying, we're going we're gonna to have to look at a lot of motherboards. Let, let me go ahead and oh, break. Sure, it's sure. going to be a lot of motherboards. Let me, break, let me go ahead and break my own NDA. We've got a 7700K sitting on that test bed over there, and, <laughs> it, has been, and it has been benchmarked, okay? Um, and it has been power-consumed. And it has been overclocked, uh, and How you will it see look? that it, lo it looked like a processor. Oh, okay. Um, it will you will see that before or right as CES starts, right? Um, and so you'll see, I don't know, a thousand Z two seventy motherboards. I mean, I've already gotten like five of them in here. Oh, great. Um, you know that that whole refresh is going to happen, and and, the, and there's not just like the CPU. There's no like for for desktop consumers. There's very little major change in the CPU. Yep. There's basically no change in the motherboard chipset itself. Four, but, more, four more lanes on the chipset, big deal. Yeah, and the motherboard vendors just kind of use these iterations as chances to refresh feature sets and add new things of their yeah. own and, and, and you know do other stuff. They, they, they do what they can do with what they're given. Um, but it does get more difficult as the years go on. So you, you'll definitely see Cabby Lake... S, as they call it, which is the consumer side, right? The the seventy seven hundred K, seventy yeah, seventy seven hundred K, and whatever other SKUs there will be, I guess. When's the last time 
Intel and AMD were both talking about brand new processor, or, well, brand new processors, not architectures at the yeah. same time. It's been forever. Bulldozer. Yeah. Well, wasn't Bulldozer in between Intel releases? Yeah, but see, like it, it, it Kaby, Lake, own... Kaby Lake doesn't count as that. If if any if any arch- if any uh, generational release from Intel doesn't count as a new release, this would be it, right? <laughs> I mean, would be what I I uh, what is it? Uh, Phenom two and uh, the original i seven came out pretty close together. Really? Well, the, yeah, the the yeah, Phenom two came so. out, and then later that year. The first i7, 920, 940. Oh, the one that Alan is still using. Yeah. <laughs> you still using the Core i7? No, he's moved on to like a 2600K. The 920 is in my uh, basement running the RAID. Oh, okay. All right. 72 terabyte RAID. Gotcha. Keeps, uh, it keeps getting larger. So, yes, there will be two new processors things. Like, So, to be fair, Ryzen won't be launching products at CES. Um. Intel will be launching products at CES. Mm-hmm. Shit, they're already for sale if you go to Micro Center, right? right. Like people yeah. are buying them. <laughs> yep. So why I can't post a story is beyond me, but whatever. Um, so now let's move on to displays uh, and what we might see from there. Somebody put in there's notes here for like OLED uh, overload. Haha. <laughs> OLED HDR. I think that's going to be what we're going to, you're going to see a I, lot of this year I around would, every corner. I hope so. I would love to OLED see HDR. HDR monitors not just hdr tvs have kind of seen hdr tvs i want to see hdr monitors the ones that are 30 inches and below like things you would put on your desk except for alan right things the the biggest sizes you would put on your desk 30 32 inch displays lower you know 4k 25 by 14 hdr gaming displays yeah that's what i want to see can we can we go ahead and workshop workshop something real quick? I okay. want to make sure we're on the same page. Okay. So inevitably, when we see someone at CES and they say, "Look at our new HDR monitor," what series of questions do we have to ask them to figure out if it's really HDR? <laughs> <laughs> there, I, there's how many long, nits is this display? What color space is it operating? What, what in? percentage of Rec Twenty Twenty is it? What percentage of like, uh, that's going to be a disaster? Uh, whether it's HDR, so it's like four G compatible or like. Yeah. 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 Uh what can I say here? Does it come uh, with a special there, profile for HDR for your system? Because that's not how that works, Alan. Well, it's your if it's not doing the full gamut. So here's the problem with okay. <laughs> the, the when we did that spell of Are testing us when we tested a bunch of displays that came in, right? <laughs> yes. And we were putting out profiles for them so that they would actually undershoot their range because they were more greater than hundred percent. Of the range. Okay. Now you're going to have ones that are significantly lower than 100%. In other words, like you'd also want a profile for them. For them to work properly. Out I, of the box. I think, no, I, I think what you want is, you don't want to have to install a profile. Manufacturers yeah, used to provide profiles. <laughs> Yes, thank you, you Josh. You, you, yes, gonna, profiling is racist. You're going to calibrate the monitor like normal in sRGB mode, and then it's only going, going to go into HDR mode when the game senses the metadata to put in HDR mode. Yes, but my you're point is... You're never going to use HDR mode on your Windows my, desktop. My point is that we got to the point where most of the regular monitors, the non-HDR monitors, were, do, were covering the full color space. Mm-hmm. Then everybody kind of moved away from providing profiles. Yeah. Now... In, in 1998, yeah. Sure. But now you have monitors that are going to come out that are not doing 100% of the new HDR profile. What profile? It's a different profile. It isn't up for standard? There, there is no standard. There are right. multiple it's competing a, it's just, standards. It's just a different color space. It's just multiple different color spaces. And Windows has those color spaces installed. The problem is, like, you, if the monitor doesn't do the full thing, you would provide a profile. I think you'll see... Direct interfaces between the monitors and software. I guess. This is really. Uh, let me a say this. Question. I know for sure you will see interfaces between the monitors and software <laughs> to to negotiate HDR color. Oh spaces. sure, but something you without have to install ha- with no. Okay. Without having to like install a profile and have Windows do anything. Now, whether or not that will happen on all applications, I know of games that it will happen for. Right, a game will be able to say, "Hey, 
I know your color space. Great. Yeah. It can go into that mode. It sounded like a driver thing to me. It sounds like a thing. Yeah. It right? sounds like somewhere in the software stack, this might be solved. Okay. Um, the, but the problem is, is once you get into like, if it's, if it's vendor specific, driver specific, then you get into complications of, yeah. does this monitor work like G-Sync, FreeSync, yeah. right? Do you want it to become something like that? Yeah. You don't really, you and, actually, and you actually really want windows to do all of it. Yeah. You want windows to just do it. You want windows to know, you want windows to negotiate the, the color space. It would be nice if through it, metadata, not through some sure. me having to, inst I mean, if I, if I have to install a driver from a monitor, that's fine. I guess, yeah. Don't tell me I have to install a profile because that process is a pain in the ass. Sure. Because the if, Windows color management tool hasn't changed since Windows 95? Yeah. Probably. It hasn't. So, but if I, there used to be a time where you had to install a driver for a monitor. You had to. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Vision Tech. Yeah. I used to oh, yeah. install them right? regularly. And yeah. and so if that's what we have to go to, to get HDR to work well, then uh, fine. Who okay. cares? Yeah, I guess. Right? It's, it's literally doing the exact same thing you're asking it to do. Giving Windows all the information about its profile information. Yeah. So, in any event, hopefully at CES we'll see that. Hopefully. I, yes. I, my, my prediction is we'll only see a couple of OLED displays, but we'll see a lot of HDR displays. Yeah, H HDR and OLED don't have to go together. No, they don't. And chances are they won't because OLED can't get that bright. Yeah, but it can get that dark. So yeah, it can. so so it can it the can ha it can good. have the contrast. It can have the contrast. Yeah. It. Yeah, but I, I think that people doing, like, you wouldn't want a first-generation full HDR display to be so limited on, like, how many nits it can put out because that's one of the big specs for HDR stuff. Is the max brightness? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Um, Scott's trying to type something into our Slack, but he's not typing fast enough for me to, to say something. He, he wanted to have his input in the OLED discussion not fast enough. Type faster, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> We're waiting. Uh, what about in terms of new storage? We talked about Optane already. We expect to see other devices using Optane. We might see some other Optane thing. I don't think we're going to see a lot. Is it all going to be in notebooks? The, I think the stuff we'll see... Are we going to see a desktop Optane? Uh, okay, so we'll probably see the stuff we've seen so far, like the, the Micron like development board that we saw, that I saw at Flash Memory Summit, last Flash Memory Summit, right? Um which was like four or eight lanes of mm -hmm. PCIe connected to Crosspoint. So just like super crazy, stupid, fast kind of stuff. Right. right? Um, but again, development, you know, not shipping, right? Um, probably see some form of Intel thing, maybe like that. <laughs> what, what was it? Light Peak that we just saw sitting in a booth. So make sure when you're at the Intel booth, you're looking around for stuff that looks like it might have Crosspoint on it. Yeah. Because uh, at one point we saw a demo board for a thing that like nobody had talked about anywhere, and it was just sitting in the booth, and we were at a meeting that had nothing to do with that. It's like on the counter. <laughs> it was just sitting on the desk on a yeah. coffee table in a booth. <laughs> we're like, I forgot that was even a thing. We're like, to be honest what's with this? And they're like, oh, that's. Uh, I think they didn't mean to leave that in that room for us, but anyway, um, we'll see some of that. We'll see uh, probably more uh, DRAM-less NVMe SSDs which is where you have the controller, you you put a very tiny amount of DRAM built into the controller so you don't have an external DRAM chip right. that makes the, the thing cheaper to make, right? So you're trying to bring NVMe cost per gig down to SATA levels or even below SATA levels eventually. Um, so the DRAM list thing is a way to go for that, right? Sure. Um, we have a few SSDs in that were relatively new that people will be showing at CES that we just haven't you know, gotten the new test bed reviewed on yet, like... Uh, the results are in the charts. We just haven't given it a proper, like, right. here's the packaging and here's all the other stuff, right? Um, storage stuff other than that, I mean, you know. What about might, hard drives? They might be. What might do we be, do with hard drives? Uh, nobody said anything, but I wouldn't be surprised if we see like 12 a 10 te terabyte no. helium. Well, no, that's a thing already. Oh. Uh, but it's an art. <laughs> 15 <laughs> terabyte helium. Uh, 14 is one already, but it's an archival. Um... And both of those are enterprise only. But what I wouldn't be surprised to see is like a 10 terabyte red. I may, maybe we'll get surprised with the 10 terabyte Western Digital red. Because the 10 terabyte, mm. H, there's an HE10 already. And we know that Western Digital's HE, or uh, red 8 terabyte was basically just an HE8 with like different firmware on it. So I'd like to see that same thing happen because, you know, that'd be a dirt cheap 
helium filled 10 terabyte drive. That'd be pretty good. Um, what else is on here? Uh, we already talked about motherboards and AM4 City. We talked about Cabby Lake, 4K HDR, Dolby Atmos, DTSX, uh, more RGB lights. I think we'll see less RGB lighting at this CES than ever before. I think there'll be drones all over the damn place, but that's yeah, not really. I feel like that's died down a little bit too. Internet of things. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, yes. I think we're done with the, that too. There, there was just a drone racing league thing on ESPN. I'm trying to look through recently. my Yeah, but like here. Scrabble's on ESPN. I guess. Polcom, Polcom is teased. They're going to talk about the 835 more. Let's see. Asus. What, what would they announce? Motherboards, new laptops. Yeah. Phone, maybe. Sure. Routers. Zenfone 3. Intel's going to talk we, about Are Kaby we Lake. pushing more towards more small form factor? It seems like, you know, first we saw oh. Asus doing these and then Gigabyte with like the bricks. Little, you and mean then the Zotac joined in. Do you mean like and, uh, do you mean like small laptops or do you mean like uh, the nooks? No, like little boxes. Yeah, like nooks that are pretty. Yeah, I mean we've seen nook, we've seen kind of growth year by year. Is this going to be a bigger breakout year for those? No, I don't know. I don't there there have been kind of a lot of little breakout years for those things, right? Like the, the Intel nook has been that thing that's just been there and iterated on, and they do a good job of updating it yeah. and and keeping it relevant and keeping the performance where it needs to be. And a few people buy it. And, and that's I just, the end of it. And I just, <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I will say this: I see more of those out and about than I've ever thought I would. Right, yeah. like, especially yeah, you know, at point of sale stuff, slapped correct. on the back of yeah. a monitor. At, at the vet that we go to, they have nooks in the back of their monitors. I noticed. You see a lot of those Zotag Z boxes. Yep, insane. see a lot of yes. I, I think yes. I think the thing that works against those is that you get close when you like a, a decent nook costs some money. It's not a cheap thing. Sure, but... Right? And you almost get to the point where you could just buy the equivalent laptop and just leave it closed. But it's and form factor. But sure. Yeah, but that's... It, it's going on the reception. I'm going to mount desk. it to that Visa mount on the back of that Dell. Oh, yeah, they're great for that. Right? That's why we always see them at... Or gaff tape you know, it to the back of well, that, maybe. Yeah. You know, whatever it takes. That's why we always see them in that application, like at CES. I think for, that's where they're, where they're at. You know, uh, yeah. uh, dis wall displays, you know, things like that, mall kiosks, they're run off of that type of stuff. Sure. Um... I don't know if I see any big revolution in that, though, Josh. Uh, like, I have NVIDIA on here, right? So are they going to announce the GTX 1080 Ti? At Maybe. CES? GP102 based? Have we? Have, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I know jack all about it. If they, if they, they announce it, it's launched, a total surprise. Has NVIDIA ever launched a GPU at CES? Oh, sure. I a, don't know a big when. One. I don't know. Maybe. Because it's kind of a big one. Yeah, GeForce but it's already Ultra. out. It's already out. Say again, Josh. No, I guess GeForce 2 Ultra was more Comdex. Man, I don't remember that far back. I mean, it's just going to be the Titan X. So, it, it's, like, it's, it's, already, it, it's already a thing. Yeah, yeah. like the GPU already launch. exists. It's will they make a consumer variant of it, right? When sure. will they make a consumer sure. variant of it? And, and maybe in, NVIDIA does it because they want to counter some of the noise and racket that Vega might make at CES, right? Yeah. And they do it there. But, like... Not being bound by any NDAs, like I don't have one here. I don't have it tested. It's not. There's not a review launching at CES. Right. Right. So, what they're going to do, I don't know. I mean, there'll be a lot of VR <laughs> Maybe stuff. There is, we'll and it's going to show up tomorrow, and you're going to be busy I'm for the next two days. Super pissed. <laughs> Happy um, New Year, Ryan. Here's a GPU. You have 48 hour turn. Yeah. <laughs> Not that it hasn't happened before. I'm going to send it to you with you to test in your <clears throat> hotel room. Yes, yes. Yeah. Bring you a test 48 bed. 48 hours. Bring a test bed to see No, you they're going to send me the card tomorrow, but I don't get the driver until Saturday. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I know how this works. What about the Shield TV 2? There's been rumors about a Shield TV 2. Yeah. I don't know what that gets them this because is, there's no. Oh, you know. Uh, what? They're going to talk Pascal what? Tegra. Regardless of if anyone wants to hear it, think about the last three CESs. Yeah, and it's, it's all been about um, cars, 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 smart, cars, smart devices. And, and now they actually have pull in it, right? Now they've been selling stuff, you know, revamped the new stuff in the new Teslas. Mm -hmm. um, they've actually got hardware in a lot of cars. Yeah, Audi. not just Teslas. Yeah. And I, I think I, it makes sense for them to talk about it. Whether whether or not it's it's interesting or shows any interesting integrations will be up in the air, because we we're we're pretty sure that the Nintendo Switch is using Tegra X1, yeah, Maxwell based, right? Is that Maxwell? Yeah, and then uh, yeah, and then it's not using whatever Pascal would be. So, uh, what else do I have in here? Dell. Uh, how about do, do you think 4K Blu-ray is actually going to take off, or is it going to be a Betamax thing? I, mean, I don't know. Did Blu-ray take off? 
No, yeah. 4K Blu-ray. I know. But did Blu-ray take off? Yeah, quite a bit. They did. I mean, not as much as DVD. It but took it, off as much as a off. physical medium could <laughs> in, anymore. In this day, yeah. Um, I bought, I have purchased two 4K Blu-rays. Uh, what did I buy? Mad Max and some Marvel movie because I don't know. Um, and I have a 4K TV, not HDR. And I have an Xbox One S that has a 4K Blu-ray player in it. And I think it looks fine. Like, I don't, yeah. I, it's, the, the problem is, is, I don't know. And I kind of try to do this for a living and I played it back and I was watching it and I go, is this in 4K? Does this look better than it did when it was in 1080p in Mad Max? Hmm. I, I mean, Full yeah. Upscaling on a 4 like, and I, I just I've, don't know. Depends on how close you're sitting. And if I, I had the screen side by side, and that's the problem, is I didn't. I had to switch between a 1080p Blu-ray and a 4K Blu-ray. Yeah. And try to go back to the same scenes. But even as fast as you can change it, as slow as it is to load, you're talking about four or five minutes of sure. time between that. Yeah. Right. And, and like I know, and Ma- Mad Max has film grain in it. Yeah. And so I'm getting really close to the screen and I'm like, your film grain looks a little crisper. Maybe this is how it's supposed to be grainy. And I don't, I don't know. And like you can right now on Vudu, you can buy the digital version of Mad Max Fury Road and like probably like 30 megabit H265 with HDR. Sure. Are you ever really going to tell a difference? I don't know. Mm. Josh likes his discs, damn it. He really does. Blu-rays are do nice like physical discs. medium. They are. They yeah. are. The nice feel in the hand. They don't really scratch do you, uh, or bend or anything. Like do you, or anything. Do you burn many uh, like Blu-rays for storage? Do you do that? Who Josh? are you asking? You, Josh. No, the no, guy actually with, I don't. The guy with the Blu-ray player. No, I've got a 10-year-old uh, set of hard drive I put all my really good documents on. Oh, okay. <laughs> and it's just been running, so you know I expect it to keep going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's last yeah. forever. Backups are for pussies. Yeah. <laughs> that's what. Hey, here you go. Death, yeah, definitely. Uh, let me look at the rest of my options here. I've got means of the Corsair, cases, coolers, power supplies. That schedule looks busier than previous years for some reason. It's meeting. not. Shh, don't oh. tell anybody. Okay. Um, AMD, you know, we've kind of already talked about what we'll see from them. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I honestly, honestly do not have much expectation, right? We've got meetings with EVGA and all the, all the normal yeah. people that I would normally meet with. It, just, CES it, it feels that. iterative. Yeah. The CES feel like there's not this amazing thing. Something will shock me. I'm right? sure. Like right? I'm sure, but it'll probably, it, I don't know. I mean, it, it'll be a lot more interesting than last year. Nothing happened last year. Um, well, like, you know, going and seeing that uh, Dell no. 30 inch OLED for the first time. And you're like, Oh, Right. That's nice. And then that's about it. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, get into our hardware software picks um, for the week as I quickly go back into mine. Um, This is what I have. And and this is a caveat in that I haven't done a lot of testing with this yet, but I've only been messing with it for a little bit. This is the ZenBook 3. I think they've already already announced it. It's got a thing on their website. This is the ZenBook 3 UX 390 UA. It is a super thin laptop. really thin. It is. It's like a, the, the the width of a pencil. If well, that, yeah. I mean, it's very similar to the new MacBooks. Cut, yes, very similar. Same uh, same design styling. It might even look a little thinner, at least on the edges. It might. Um, uh, it is a here, but here. So this is the super thin. Uh, let me. I'm going to bring up my task manager here to make sure. It really. I'm looking at it edge on. This is a Cavi Lake like, processor. This is not a uh, Core M part. This is yeah. a Core i7, 7500U, so a dual core hyper threaded nice. part. Right? It's something that thing. it does have a fan in it, and you can hear the fan when it's running. Well, okay. uh, Ken and I were talking before the the MacBook is passive because it's a Core M. This is a 15 watt part in this tiny ass, tiny, tiny, tiny. Like it has. How do you even fit a fan in there? Wait, wait. Does the fan do? Does the MacBook have a headphone jack? Yeah. Oh, it does. Okay. So that's the thing. The kind of the kind of fan that you would have to put in there would be like, like an axial kind of like blower thing, which is probably why it's so noisy. Screen looks good. Like it would have to be a, uh, you know, it would have to it would have to spin the air in a circle around it and blow it out Actually, in a direction. If you or look, do you have like a picture I think I of have a, a picture of that. Uh, hold on, let me get through all this crap. Yeah, like you I mean, you, isn't that how laptop fans work? They're anyways? usually not 
not they usually have some There's kind of fan. like angled blades to them. Three I don't millimeter think thermal one, system. Yeah. Three Yeesh. millimeter fan is not gonna be like a regular fan where the blades with a 0.3 millimeter no. liquid crystal polymer. Liquid crystal pulp to do what? I don't know, man. The it's a uh, components such as a liquid crystal crystal polymer fan impeller that's just 0.3 millimeters thick and a copper alloy heat pipe with walls a mere 0.1 millimeter thick. I, I don't think that that phrase means what they think that means. State of the art components such as a liquid crystal polymer fan impeller. Like, what does liquid crystals have to do with the the thing that's spinning? That's just point. It's a, it's a liquid crystal polymer. What else do you need to know? Oh. Under, it says it maybe on the page. that's the lubrication. May, uh, uh, it has know. a fingerprint reader on the touchpad. Uh, that's cool. Look now, at all that battery, though. Uh, Look it at is, how small that PCB is. Yeah, that's actually impressive, right? The PCB is, is tiny. <laughs> that's the whole system. The whole right thing there. is battery. It's, I think it's got like a forty watt, yeah, forty watt hour battery in this, which is which is really impressive. They claim up to nine hours of battery life. Um, now, the negative to this is the same negative we had with the MacBook, which is it only has one connection, and it's one uh, USB Type-C connection. And then what's on the other side? Headphone? Yeah, and a headphone port on this side. Uh, all right. So if, for charging, for connectivity, for everything, has to go through that one port. Yeah. Makes How's things the key travel on that thing? It's okay. It's not great. It's obviously bad. But the trackpad is awful. It's, it's, is it? Yeah. Really? It opens really nice. Let's see that. Uh, I, yeah, there's, I not, there's stand not a lot the of throw. I, I actually use the tapping as opposed to the clicking of touchpads a lot recently. Like, I don't push down. Like, I just tap with my finger. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I get you. I just don't agree. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, all right, fine. Uh, I hear what you're saying. So if you do that, it's fine. But yeah, there's not a lot of travel on the trackpad. The keys are fine. They're fine. Uh, but like I said, I haven't done a whole lot of testing on this uh, yet, but it is impressively built. And it's basically the same size or smaller than the MacBook, but it has a, a higher end processor in it. It is about 1500 bucks. It's on sale at Newegg, I think, for 1599 or 1549 right now. 16 gigs of memory, 512 gig SSD. 1080p, 10, uh, Windows 10. I mean, that's those are good specs. 512 that's gig SSD ludicrous. and 16 gigs of memory for 1500 bucks, and you get it in that form factor. Oh, it's yeah. only a 1080p display. Oh, okay. Only. Yeah. Well, but that's that's fine. If we're comparing it to the MacBook, the MacBook has the higher resolution sure. display. Okay. Yeah. If you get it with eight gigs and two hundred fifty six gigs, uh, and a Core i five on the Core i seven, it's nine ninety nine. That's nine ninety nine. That's, a, that's nice. a good price. Johnny Shu. And I imagine proud. the performance delta between those two processors is pretty close. And to you're going to get the same battery. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. So there's two configurations: sixteen gig five twelve with the higher end processor, <clears throat> or eight gig two fifty six. <coughs> so there you go that's pretty impressive uh yeah. yeah it is like i said we'll have we'll have more testing on this in the uh near term future who is next josh we don't have a jeremy so you're up next jeremy he's he's hoping for new luggage for the new year yeah yeah Unlo unlost luggage yeah uh you know i i picked this one because uh large driver earbuds with microphone for mono price decent quality they sound okay. Six ninety nine. They're on sale. So three he, bucks off. Somebody in the chat I mean, room, sorry, just sent me a link to a tiny liquid crystal polymer axial flow cooling fan. On uh, that must be the bearing from Guangdong, China. Just minimum just, order two thousand pieces. I just anyway. don't get where the crystal comes into play. Anyway, so yeah. these headphones six ninety nine still $6 still pretty good. Yeah, they're they're shockingly. Josh, each, each of your you know, kids I has a set of these now, of right? I these for the kids because they go through them like candy. <laughs> I was just asking if all your kids had them already. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Six ninety nine plus the nine dollar lightning to headphone jack adapter. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Can leave these stashed all over. You're the place, implying Ryan. that Josh's kids have iPhone seven. No, I'm talking about Ryan. He's already thinking about ordering three of these. Oh. <laughs> I, don't know. I mean, yeah. <laughs> plus the nine dollar nice adapter. The modern price still an adapter yet? These headphones are not any cheaper if I buy 2 to 9, 10 to 19, 20 to 49, or 50 plus units, though. I don't even know why they bother with the listing. <laughs> Bulk discount for everyone. The normal price goes down from 999 to 972 to 945, but the sale price stays 699 across the board. Yeah. So there's that. I think that's fair. Because 699 is dirt cheap for anything that even works. I agree. Much less sounds okay. I agree with that. All right, Alan. Do you suffer from dry eye? No. No. Oh. Well, 
This is neither hardware nor software. Uh, it applies to all the people watching and reading that, or that you know, if you're reading our podcast, their, you're sitting on your dang computer for hours on end. You probably have used eye drops at some point, or are going to. No. Anyway, no. All right, no. fine. Listen, kid. Um, my eyes are just good. So Thank you. I've gone through all sorts of different eye drops, mm -hmm. uh, and somehow, uh, I don't know what kind of magic voodoo crap is going on in these. But usually, just chemicals. Well, I mean, so usually with eye drops, it's a, it's a trade off. Like if you want the stuff to last a while, you need like a thicker fluid. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like you know gooey gel kind of crap, right? As opposed I haven't to, done this much research, but I, I believe I, you. Yeah, there's you know it's a trade off like how thin versus thick <laughs> is, is the gel of the eye drop. Eye <laughs> yeah, and then that and then how thick the eye drop material or whatever it's made of is kind of like determines how long it sticks around and how often you have to like put them back in, right? Uh, these eye drops, the Cysteine Ultra, and then they have like a version that's not Ultra that I think has less preservatives in it or something like that. But uh, it's like they're really thin eye drops. Like the the liquid is just like a regular kind of eye drop that you wouldn't expect to last more than like a, you know, 15, 20 minutes or something. Yeah. Uh, I've been using these things like once a day. Are these good for people with contacts? Uh, I'm not sure. I, I would imagine there's a crap load of good reviews there and like, yeah, you know, know. Uh, I mean, if you're if you're worried about it for contacts, I would get the version of this. that's like one step down. Which I forget what it's called. It's not Ultra, but it's like some other. These eye drops are available at Costco. I'm told. Uh, I would uh, not recommend Dream Seventy Six that you put Vaseline in your eyeballs. No, 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 it's not good. <laughs> <laughs> I would not do that. Um, there's a Sustained Balance is the one step down, um, which is like I guess has less preservatives in it, but yeah. you can only buy it in like a really tiny vial, yeah, because it's meant to not last very long, and you know the Ultra <laughs> one is like a pretty big size thing that you get. Um, there's, there's actually uh, RGB eye drops are greater than liquid crystal eye drops. <laughs> Do these eye drops have any ozone in them? Because last time you did a pick with any <laughs> yes, sort of health my, my advice, retinas, my retinas and my corneas are just like you know oxidizing right now with these. You check the EPA's regulation on these, like those ozone yeah. generators. Um, does it work good for stoned eyes? Asks the chat. <laughs> Probably. Uh, funny story about the. Uh, the Vaseline thing. Uh, okay. The, like petroleum jelly is in the thicker eye drops. Okay. Like petroleum is like, you know, Oil. what's in there. Yeah. And like there's even, there's stuff that's meant for like PM, something PM eye drops. It's meant for like overnight to stop your eyes from drying out overnight. And that's basically like uh, almost like a petroleum jelly mineral oil paste stuff, which I've dabbled no, good. with. Which, which is annoying because you wake up and the stuff is still in your eyes and everything's still like, you can't see crap because everything's all, you know, you have a layer of freaking Vaseline on your eyeballs, basically, which is annoying, right? I would I would assume that would be the case, yeah. yes. So, so shifting to this stuff. Make it very hard to see things in anything clear. Yes, yes. So shifting to this, uh, I it, it doesn't blur your vision at all, and it just somehow keeps your eyes from drying out for long periods of time. So it's, it's good for computer people. It's a win-win. I guess. Yeah. I guess. Well, no. In a five years, if I get like eye cancer or something, uh, you know, then he's blind. I mean, I'm you're already kind of had to go get glasses today. I don't know if this is really what I, I did. How long have you been using those eye drops, Alan? Oh, like a week. Uh oh. Uh oh. Think yeah. about it. All right, everybody. That's going to be it for this week's episode of the PC Perspective Podcast. There will not be a normally scheduled podcast next week. Um, because we will be, uh, three of us at least will be in Las Vegas for CES. Um, we might try to do a podcast just now at the right No, I think, time. I think we'll do yeah. podcasts. Uh, you were going to say something, Josh? I was, you know, I, I forgot to mention. And, uh, this past week, uh, I, I did a recording about Zen with the uh, Linux Gamecast people. So go check them out. Uh, it's a interesting 10 or 15 minute, uh, thing where we talk about AMD, a little bit of the past and uh, what we expect from Zen. Cool. And, uh, to talk to Zen and the, uh, not Zen, but Ven. <laughs> And Stone of the Gang. You talk to yeah, Zen himself? It's amazing. Zen to Ven. Cool, cool. Um, so uh, because the podcast will not be a normally scheduled episode, we'll probably do multiple, probably. It's all, we're, we're at a new hotel this year, so it all depends on 
bandwidth and restrictions yep. and that kind of shit. Um, so uh, go to pcpro.com slash subscribe, sign up for that notifications list. I will make sure that we send out news about when we're going to do the podcast as soon as I know when we're going to do it. Um, and uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Ryan Shroud or follow at PC per and uh, I'll make sure we post when we're going to do them there as well. So, and then obviously make sure you just hit up PC um, throughout all of 2017, but the first week or so of 2017 will be stock full of CS news as guys like Jeremy and Scott and Josh and Sebastian uh, are hanging back at home to cover all the new stuff while Alan and me and Ken run around with our heads cut off. No, like our heads are like, cut off. Like chickens with their heads cut yeah. off. What's the difference? Yeah, it's not really at any. this point. Yeah. Nothing. Uh, so we'll be back next week with another episode. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time. I'm Ryan Schrout. I'm Josh Walrus. And I'm Alan Momentano. If you enjoyed this content, consider supporting in-depth technical content by contributing at patreon.com slash pcper.